Well, good morning, Real Life Church. Good morning, everyone that's online. Thank you guys for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Ryan Ashley. I'm one of the elders here at Real Life Church, and we're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. Man, there is a lot going on this weekend, is there not? And it's graduation weekend. Um, at, l- later in the second service, we're going to recognize all the high school graduates. Uh, and so do we have any graduates that are in this service right now? If you, I'm not going to make you stand up or anything, but let's just give our graduates a round of applause. <laughs> Excellent. And then like Dr. Campbell said, you know, another thing, it's, it's Memorial Day weekend, right? This is a great time where we recognize and, and truly try to recognize and honor all the brave men and women that have given the ultimate sacrifice, right, for our country. And so any of you that are out there have served in the armed forces currently or, or in the past or had loved ones that have done that, thank you for that. We, we greatly appreciate your service and the freedoms we have because of that. And with that in mind, I, I'm curious. So any of you that have served in the armed forces or, or say, in the army or any type of, of armed forces, um, have you ever had to put on armor, right? Have you ever had to put on any type of protective gear, right? What about you other guys in the audience? Any of you guys put on armor this morning, right? That's not something we usually think about, is it? But it might be a little bit surprising to you, but as Christians, we're actually told that we need to put on armor every single day, right? So today we're going to be looking at this armor that's available to us as, as followers of Jesus Christ. And a key point here is this armor is only available to those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ. And so our scripture is going to be found in the book of Ephesians. This is a letter written by the great apostle Paul while he was in prison in Rome. All right. And the major theme of Ephesians is is focused on how Christians should live in this fallen world. And today we're going to focus specifically on how we should engage in our spiritual warfare. But I tell you what, before we jump into scripture, let's let's go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I I thank you, God, for all that we have and your just boundless mercies and unconditional love. You're slow to anger and full of grace and mercy. You just provide us with everything, Lord, and I thank you for that. Thank you for the freedoms we have in this country we live in. I thank you for the men and women who have died for us, Lord, that we can be up here and speak freely about you. Lord, I just pray for the service today that you just might open hearts and minds and pray that you just work through me and I might be a vessel for you, Lord, and just use me, Lord, for your purpose. And I pray that... Above all, that your presence be felt and your will be done, God. I thank you, Lord, for this armor that we have. And I thank you, Lord, for this word, this scripture, this Bible that you've given us. It is active and alive. And I just pray that you would open it today. And it may just reveal things to us, Lord, that we've never seen before. In your son's name, amen. All right. So if you've got your Bible or a Bible app, we're going to be in Ephesians. That's in the New Testament. So Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. And I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It says, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having prepared everything to to take your stand. Stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with the readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request. And stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all of the saints. So to start with, I want to give you a couple of take-home points. So in case you fall asleep for the rest of the service here, if you can just jot down these first two things, you should be good to go. Take-home point number one. First and foremost, if you didn't realize that you were in a battle, then most likely you are losing that battle. All right? Number two, there is some good news, though. As Christians, God has provided everything that we need to fight these battles on a daily basis. All right, now you can go back to sleep. No, please don't. Okay, well, let's see what Paul says about our battles and how we're we're supposed to prepare for them. He starts this section by saying, finally be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. You know, we're at the end of the letter that Paul wrote here. And so basically up to this point, Paul has carefully established our place in Jesus Christ and the basics of the Christian walk. And now he's in this last section dealing with this walk. 
And so for Paul to write, finally, what this means is he's speaking of, in light of everything that I have just previously said, okay? So in light of the fact that God has done all these amazing things for you, in light of the glorious standing you have as a child of God, in light of his great plan that God has made you a part of, in light of the plan for Christian maturity and growth that he gives to you, in light of the conduct that God calls every believer to live, and in light of the feeling of the Holy Spirit and our walk with that spirit, in light of all these things, he says, I need you to do two things. One, be strong in the Lord and in his vast strength. And then two, then put on the full armor of God. These two are essential, right? We can't neglect the first, right? If you were to take some, a weak person who can barely stand and we take the best armor in the world and we put it on that person, he is going to be an ineffective soldier, right? If he's not strong enough to carry the armor, He's not going to be a very effective soldier, right? It kind of makes me think about like, you know, uh, David when he was a shepherd boy and he went to go fight the, the giant Goliath, right? All he had was his sling and, and his rocks, right? But King Saul tried to put, they tried to put all of King Saul armor on this little boy and it was ineffective, right? He wasn't strong enough to walk around with this armor. So before we can do anything with this armor that Paul's going to talk about, first and foremost, man, we got to be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength so that we can even put the armor on. Now, to be strengthened by the Lord, to me that means, well, first, we got to know Jesus. You got to know the Lord if you're going to be strengthened by Him. You know, despite what we often think, our strength does not come from our own efforts, right? It's not from inside us, it comes from God, right? It comes from the Holy Spirit that's living in us. That same power that rose Jesus from the grave, that's the power that's inside us. That's the strength that we call upon. That's the strength we need when we put on this full armor of God. And it's also going to take faith, right? But once we've been strengthened by God, <clears throat> he tells us then to put on the full armor of God. And the emphasis here is on the full set of the armor. Right? We're going to see that we have basically six different pieces here that we're going to put on. And the emphasis here is we've got to put it all on. We can't just pick and choose what we want. God has provided everything that we need to go out into battle. <laughs> but this kind of raises an interesting question. Why would Paul command us to put on armor unless we needed it? Right? So then that asks the question, like, well, then who are we fighting? What, who are we supposed to be going to battle with? And Paul explains this next, right? We come back to Ephesians 6, going in, in verse 12. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against the evil spiritual forces in the heavens. I think there's some interesting things that, that we can note here, Right? One, Paul did not ask us to come join him in a battle. He didn't say, hey, come on over here, man. We're down here at the front lines. I could use some backup. Let's go fight, right? He didn't ask us to go fight this battle. He just stated it like a fact, right? He just simply announced it that this is a fact. He says, hey, we do not struggle against flesh and blood, but it's implied that we do struggle, though, with the authorities, right? We do struggle against the cosmic powers of this darkness, we do struggle against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. So whether we like it or not, we are in a battle. But the other key factor that Paul brings up is that our battle is not against flesh and blood, right? It's not against people. Our battle is not against your spouse. Our battle is not against your boss. It's not against your kids. It's not against your friends. It's not against your enemies. It's not against your parents. It's not against your teachers, right? You can think about any human you can think about. Think about the person that annoys you the most, right? Like, God, that John Campbell drives me crazy, right? But my battle's not against Dr. Campbell, is it? I'm just joking, John. I love you. But the point here is that we're not called to battle people, are we, right? But this is so often forgot by Christians, and so often we put our efforts into battling other people when that's just futile effort, just wasted energy. We are fighting a spiritual battle against the devil and his demons. That's the facts, right? Don't forget, Satan is real. He's not some myth. I mean, one of the greatest tricks Satan ever played is trying to let people believe that he doesn't exist, right? He is very real, right? And he was an angel in heaven, and then due to his pride trying to overthrow the Lord, right, he was cast out of heaven, right? But not only Satan, who else went with him? A third of the angels went with Satan, right? That means that there's a third of the angels which are his demons okay so that's who we're fighting against you know it's irrelevant if we call them some cosmic powers or the darkness of this age or the prince of the air whatever it doesn't matter at the end of the day we're fighting satan and his army right our battle is against satan and his army not people not against flesh and blood 
So if we've got this spiritual battle, then that means we need some spiritual armor, right? We can't fight this battle with human armor. That's never going to work. You know, without the strength of God and the protection of his spiritual armor, it's going to be impossible to stand against these schemes that the spiritual, uh, of these spiritual enemies and what they throw at us. So, so Paul goes into this next sh- section here and explains nicely the armor that we've got to put on. And what's interesting here is that each piece of armor, right, it describes a very specific spiritual trait that the believer needs to survive these attacks of the devil each and every day. All right, let's jump and let's take, I think we've got an image of a Roman soldier here. So these are going to be some of the, the pieces that we're going to go through. And I forgot my pointer. I'm a terrible professor today. Um, and so we're going to start with some of these things that, that Paul went through. And the first thing that Paul tells us to put on here in Ephesians 6 is the belt of truth, right? And so it's interesting here that what Paul goes through, this belt, we start with the belt. Well, why was this important to the Romans in the Roman Empire or the Roman army? Well, this belt known as a cingulum or a baltius, it, it played a pretty crucial role in the, in the armor for this Roman soldier. Just like today, right, we put lots of things on our belts, don't we? Right, farmers and ranchers have all kinds of things on their belt. If you're a carpenter, you've probably got all kinds of things on your belt, depending on your profession. We do lots of things with our belts. For a Roman soldier, one of the key things that he put on that belt was his scabbard, right? Your scabbard is what holds your sword. That's what keeps your sword in place. And we'll learn more about that sword a little bit later, right? But think about this. Without the belt, if you don't have a belt, man, you ain't got no place to store your sword. You're not going to be a very effective soldier if you don't have a place to store your sword, right? Likewise, with our sword of the Spirit, we're going to need a sheath. And we're going to see that we attach our sword to the belt of truth, which then raises the question of, well, what is truth? You know, this world we live in, right, it teaches that truth is whatever you make of it, right? That good and bad are just relative and that there are no absolutes, that it's only equally valid opinions. We don't want to, we've got to be tolerant of everybody. There's no right or wrong. But that's not true, right? The Bible teaches that the truth is in God's word, that the good and bad are defined by God and that there are eternal and unchangeable absolutes that are not influenced by opinions, right? We're reminding it and think about 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 16. This is one of my most favorite verses, right? We know that all scripture is God breathed. It's inspired by God. And it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for training in righteousness, right? So that the servant of God will be thoroughly equipped and prepared to do every good deed that he can do, right? We have to keep in mind, you know, with our enemy, right? Satan doesn't fight fair, does he? Satan fights with lies. That's probably one of his, his most favorite weapons. Often he's going to distort the truth and make it hard to distinguish fact from fallacy. His goal is to pull us away from the Lord and to tear us down. Man, don't forget by nature, Satan wants to destroy, to kill, and to lie. Lies are his natural language. There's nothing good about Satan. But only those who believe in and follow Jesus, those are the ones that have the true truth, right? The absolute truth. And if we ask, God can give us discernment and he can give you wisdom to know the truth to know the truth above all that noise that the devil's providing. You know, in Paul's letter to the Romans, he tells us, and we'll go to this verse in a second, that we're told not to be conformed to this world, right? Not to conform to this pattern of this world any longer. And part of this means not buying into this system that says that absolute truth is a myth. As Christians, we know that there is truth and that it's absolute, right? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? And so when we're discouraged and under attack, we've got to go back to these things that we know, right? Come back to things that are true when you're starting to get attacked by the devil. And here's some things you can hold on to. Here are some things that are absolutely true, right? God is in control. God is holy. God is righteous. God is perfect. All his ways are right. His mercy endures forever. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We are kept eternally by him, by his love. He's interceding for us now in heaven, Right? We have salvation because of Jesus Christ and all things are working together for the good, right? These are the truths that we can count on, right? God has already provided all the truth, but it's my job, right, to take that truth and to put it on like a belt and have it tight around my waist, right, so that I know what the truth is and I don't fall into those temptations, those lies that Satan shoots at us. All right, next, we're we're told to put on a breastplate of righteousness, or armor for our chest. You know, a breastplate it basically provides nice protection for your essential organs, right? You've got all your organs inside here and in your chest cavity. And what's going to be a main organ that's right here in the center of your chest? 
It's our heart, right? Where does Satan like to attack all the time? Man, we're going to see it's, it's almost always the heart and the mind, right? That's where Satan loves to attack. And so we've got to have that protected. Something that's interesting here, we notice that you know, it's a breastplate of righteousness. Notice that it's not our righteousness, right? It doesn't say put on a breastplate of self-righteousness, does it? No. Righteousness is based upon God's standards, not humans. It's not my own efforts. No one can attain true righteousness through their own efforts. Righteousness is a God-centered attribute. It's a right standing with God, right? Conforming to his will. Being in a right relationship with God. That's the righteousness we're talking about. This righteousness is not earned. You know, we don't earn it by doing stuff. It's a gift, right? We receive this righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, we're told in Isaiah uh, 64, 6 that in comparison to God's righteousness, our righteous deeds are nothing but filthy rags. And again, remember, Satan doesn't fight fair. And he's often going to attack our heart, right? The, the seat of our emotions, right? So often he attacks our hearts and our minds. That's where he, because that's what God wants, right? We're told in Deuteronomy, like one of the foundation things we should do is love the Lord our God with our heart, our soul, and our mind. Satan knows this, right? Why do you think he attacks there? If, if God wants our heart, soul, and our mind, that's where Satan's going to attack. He's always going to send arrows and things in our hearts and our minds, okay? But when we're attacked, right, we need to remind ourselves of this breastplate that we have, this breastplate of righteousness. Recall your position in Christ. Know that your identity is in Jesus Christ, right? Because of Jesus, you are righteous. Nothing you can do can make you righteous, but because of Jesus, we are absolutely righteous, right? And so when the devil attacks your heart and he's trying to get at your emotional inside your heart, know that your chest armor, right, your right standing with God can block those attacks, right? The devil can never, ever take away your position from Christ. Never. No matter what he says, your identity in Christ is solid. And that's our breastplate of righteousness. All right, next we've got to put on some shoes. All right, so we have here that our shoes, though, are fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. You know, shoes, kind of like the belt we mentioned earlier, it may initially seem you know, somewhat superfluous to be talking about this, these shoes in a discussion about spiritual armor. But can you imagine for a second trying to go out on a battlefield barefoot? I don't think so, man. And you're going to need some combat boots if you're going to go out into battle. We can't go out without some type of shoes. You know, the sandals of the Roman soldier were often fitted with nails or they had spikes in the bottom of their shoes, right? And this gave that Roman soldier some great traction, right? You're able to withstand. You've got a firm foundation, right, to fight. And in fact, you know, the military success of both Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar, a lot of that is attributed to the fact that their armies were well shod. They had good shoes and they had a firm foundation. They could cover large ground. And more importantly, they could stay secure and fight, right? They were standing and fighting on a strong foundation. So just like the Roman soldier, our combat boots provide us a foundation too, right? Our foundation, though, is in the gospel of peace, right? Well... What is this gospel of peace? You know, the Greek translated gospel, we, we've talked about this before. It just simply means good news, right? Which raises the question, the good news of what? Well, we as Christians know that this good news is, this is the good news of the kingdom of heaven, right? This is the good news that Jesus Christ has died and taken our place. The good news that we have salvation, that we're going to see Jesus one day, right? It's only the best news ever. That's what we're talking about with this, this gospel of peace. But at the same time, this also implies that there's actually some bad news as well, isn't there? We don't talk about that. We like to focus on the good news, but there's bad news too. The bad news is that those that don't have Jesus, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, you're still under God's wrath, right? You're still under the penalty of death. People need to know this, right? We need to have this, this readiness that it speaks about with the gospel of peace. This is speaking about a readiness being ready, mobile, flexible, right? We're ready to share the truth ready to share this gospel of peace, a peace that transcends all understanding, right? Man, the enemy Satan, he wants to keep us quiet. He doesn't want you talking about Jesus. He doesn't want you telling others what Jesus can do or what he's done in your life. So Satan's going to put in doubts and fears, right? He's going to put all these things in your mind saying, they're never going to listen to you. Don't talk about Jesus. People just make fun of you. You're just going to get shamed. Don't do it. He's always going to put those things in our minds, right? But if we pray and we talk to God, God will provide that strength, that boldness, and the confidence that we need to praise him publicly without fear and worry. Now, this gospel piece again, what has this got to do with shoes? 
Well, as God's church, big capital C church, but we're on a mission, right? We're sent to announce the good news of the kingdom of God. We end every service, right, saying you are a sent people. We're, out, we're supposed to go out into the world and to spread this good news of the gospel of peace, the gospel of Jesus. Share these good tidings, correct? It, it reminds me of, of Romans 10 and verses 14 and 15. We hear Paul's talking about something similar. He says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, right? When we truly allow ourselves to take comfort in the good news promised by God, there is nothing that can trouble our hearts or give us any reason to be afraid. Christ has overcome the world, right? We're told that in John 16, 33, Jesus said it plainly. He says, I have told you these things so that in, the, that in me you may have peace. But what else does Jesus say? He says, in this world you will have trouble. Not you might. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world, right? So just as our shoes allow us to walk on otherwise like painful terrain without fear, so the readiness of this gospel of peace allows us to traverse the otherwise painful trials and tribulations of life without fear. We know that what awaits us is greater than anything that we could possibly suffer in this world. It makes me think of Romans 8, 18, one of my most favorite verses. Paul says, you know, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Wow. Next, we're told to take up the shield of faith. Right, a shield that extinguishes flaming arrows. So what kind of shield did the Romans have? As you can kind of see in the image here, one thing you can tell right away, the shield was huge. Right? The shield was a typically like three to three and a half feet tall and almost the same width uh, across. It had a nice curvature to it. And so it provided lots of protection for that soldier. And due to the curv curvature nature, right, it can also deflect and would really give lots of protection to that soldier. Okay? So this, this Roman shield or a scutnum, Right? It was a very valuable, very valuable piece of equipment in their armor. What's interesting here is up until now, you know, Paul's description of the armor that, that we're supposed to put on has really been limited to items we wear. Right? He says, we've got to put on a belt of truth, then I put on a breastplate, then I put on my combat boots, I put on my shoes. But here, what's he say? But here he says, okay. But now he tells us that we have to take up the shield of faith. Right? The shield is different. Right? We've got to take it up. Everything else we just put on, it pretty much stays where it's at. But just strapping on the shield to our arm, it's not going to do any good. It's only going to be useful if we make the effort and we use that shield. We raise that shield and put it to work. So we're called to take up this, this shield of faith, which leads to another question. Well, what is faith? Actually, we have a great definition in Scripture, right? Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that, that faith is the reality of what is hoped for. It's the proof of what is not seen, right? It's being certain of what we hope for and sure of what we can't see. So if faith is this substance of reality or the things hoped for, the evidence or proof of things not seen, then this has far-reaching implications, right? Because substance is tangible and evidence is solid proof. So faith is, by definition, not some hazy emotion, right, without any grounded in reality. It is the irrefutable truth. Faith is absolutely real, right? And we're told in, in Romans 8, verses 24 and 25, because we see a lot of connection between faith and hope, right? And Paul here tells us that now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Yeah, so though faith is based on solid evidence, that doesn't mean that faith comes easy or, or just naturally, right? It's, it's hard to have faith sometimes. But Paul here makes, I think, an obvious but necessary point, right? We don't hope, though, for what we already have, right? Faith involves a huge element of trust. Faith is that reality of knowing that Jesus is coming back, right? Knowing that he is going to come back and reign forever. Don't forget, right? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? We're promised that in Hebrews 13:8. He never changes. Coming back to our shield, it's also one of our first lines of defense, right? It would deflect things. 
And we think about Satan, our enemy again, he's always hurling these flaming arrows at us, right? He even says that in scripture, he's using flaming arrows. And his flaming arrows can be arrows of fear, flaming arrows of doubt, flaming arrows of worry. That's what he's sending at us. Satan likes to attack us in the form of insults, setbacks, temptations, right? He can also use thoughts, fears. These can also be flaming arrows. The devil's plan is to derail our faith, and that can include things like using situations and certain other people, right? And it's interesting to me that Satan uses flaming arrows. Not only is he just trying to pierce us with an arrow, he wants to completely destroy. He's hoping that even if he, this arrow doesn't hit a vital part, that it'll just stay there and linger and continue to burn and destroy, right? That's what Satan wants. But faith, right, our shield of faith can turn back those flames. And we're told this shield of faith can extinguish those flaming arrows, right? They have no power against us. So, yes, yeah, Satan can be shooting all these flaming arrows all the time. But the only time they're going to injure us or hit us is when what? If we let our shield down, right? When we let our shield down, when we stop believing that God has in control or we stop believing that he's working out everything for our good, that's when we might get hit. But when our faith is strong and we, we're, our connection with God is strong and we have strong faith, it's going to be impossible for God to break through our shield of faith and land an attack. But then we start letting doubt creep in, right? And it's very similar like when Peter was, got those few steps to walk on water, right? He was doing great until he started being distracted by the waves, right? And he got, he got distracted and distorted. And he started worrying. And he started to sink. You know, another interesting thing about the shield that the Romans used, especially in terms of this context of, of when they were getting fired upon by like arrows and all these different types of projectiles being shot at them, what the Romans would do is, right, they would form together in like a rectangular array. And so basically would have all the outer soldiers put their, their shields up on the outside and all the soldiers that are in the middle basically put their shields up on top, essentially creating this shell. And it was referred to as, as a tortoise, right, basically forming like a, tur a tur tortoise or a turtle shell. So it was like this human tank that was almost unstoppable to move. You know, when the Roman army joined their shields together, it became this almost unstoppable force. But I think that's relevant for us too, right? We must remember that as we fight our battles, it's not just us, is it? It's not just our battle. This is the battle for all of us Christians, all of our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world, right? We're fighting this battle together. And so if we and God's church can join our shields, Right? That is, if we can strengthen each other with our faith, building up and serving within, within the body as we can, we can become an unstoppable force that can take on any type of challenge. All right. The next piece of armor we're told to put on now is our helmet of salvation. Helmets are pretty important, right? So just like in the Roman times, helmets today, they, they protect our head, right? We got a brain in there, hopefully, some of us, right? That's where our mind is at. So coming back to this, this, this concept, you know, Satan's always trying to attack our hearts and our minds. So we've got to have some type of spiritual protection for our minds. Satan's always wanting to make us doubt God. He wants us to doubt Jesus. He wants us to doubt our salvation. And oftentimes that struggle with Satan, where does it start? I don't know about you guys, but with me, it always starts up here. It's always in my thought life, right? Those faulty ideas or anxieties or fears that we may be holding on to, all of a sudden those start getting amped up, right, and amplified because Satan keeps throwing them in there. And all of a sudden I start listening to that, right, and we start getting worried and taking on fear. But if we call on God, he can renew us, right? He can lift our eyes and our thoughts away from that and we can stay focused on him throughout the day. Ask God and he can help protect your thought life. He can give you that helmet of salvation. Well, that kind of raises the question, too. If we got this helmet of salvation, what, what is salvation? You know, simply by definition, salvation just really means to be saved or delivered from something, right? And to be saved, that implies we need a Savior. And as Christians, we know that Jesus Christ, right, He is our Savior. He is our Lord and Savior, and that's why we have salvation. Like we're reminded in Romans 3, 23, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we know that our sins, they separate us from God. And sin is so vile to God, it's so opposite of his nature, right, that it requires the death penalty, right? Due to God's justice, that's what is required with, with sin, requires the death penalty. But out of his loving mercy and unconditional love, what did he do? He provided a way out. He provided a substitute. Jesus Christ took upon that pain, that penalty, our penalty, and died for us, right? So Jesus Christ, our creator, that's why we have salvation, 
And we're reminded of this in this same book of Ephesians. Earlier in chapter 2, Paul reminds the readers that, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, right? And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I think it's important to understand, you know, that salvation cannot be earned. It's similar to like what we talked about with righteousness, right? This is not something you can just earn by yourself and doing good things. These are gifts from God. This is something you get from God, not something you can earn. And so our salvation works like this helmet to protect our minds from the discouragement and, those, and the despair that we have in this world. When we think about this world, we're, we're called to be out of this world. We're not called to be a part of this world. Though we remain in it, we are not to remain a part of this world, right? Our way of living and even our way of thinking, Paul tells us, should be different from the world system. We're told this in Romans 12 too, right? We said, Paul commands us, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that then you can test what God's good, pleasing, and perfect will is. And Satan, our enemy, he hates the fact that we've chosen to follow Jesus and he will stop at nothing to destroy us because of it. So just as this helmet protects our head from the fatal blows of the enemy, this hope of salvation can protect our thought life. It can protect us from the enemy's attacks and those temptations that we have to disobey God. Our helmet of salvation can truly help us to transform us by renewing our mind. And another one of Satan's most effective weapons is discouragement, right? Just like lies, he likes to try to get us discouraged. But the helmet of salvation can protect us against discouragement, against those desires to give up. When we're properly equipped with the helmet of salvation and we know that the victory belongs to Jesus, man, it's hard to stay discouraged when we know that the war is already won and we know who wins it. So with the helmet securely fastened, we can have the same confidence that Paul had, right? And we talked about this verse earlier. Like Paul said, we consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So it doesn't matter what happens to us now, no matter what trials we face, or we know that at the end, we have God's kingdom and eternity with him in his perfect reign. What can be better than that? So no matter what comes, no matter what vicious attacks that, the, that Satan's going to throw our way or what fiery arrows he shoots at us, we know that as long as we remain in God and with Christ, we are moving slowly but unstoppably towards an eternal victory. Right? This is the salvation we're fighting for, to enter that glorious kingdom with God forever. Never lose sight of this, guys. All right, finally we get to the last piece of armor, our weapon. Oh, oh, all right. Man, we're going to see what kind of weapon we got here. We got the weapon, the sword of the spirit. Okay, this sword, similar to our shield, is something we got to take with us, right? In fact, it's the only item listed by Paul that serves in offensive capacity. It's our only weapon. I don't know about you, but I was thinking like, man, I'm thinking if we're going to have spiritual armor, we're going to probably have some really awesome spiritual weapons. That was my thought. I'm thinking we're going to have like vests full of like Beelzebub bomb. Maybe I'm going to get like a Hades flamethrower or something. But no, we don't have anything like that, do we? We only have one weapon. Why is that? Why do we only have one weapon? Because we only need one weapon, right? We've got to remember this is a spiritual battle. This is not a human battle. There is no enemy that the word of God, that our sword, with the power of the Holy Spirit, can't defeat, right? There's nothing that we can't defeat with the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And our sword is the word of God. We're told that here in Scripture. And the Bible is not just some book. It's not just the best-selling book of all time. It is God-breathed. It's God-inspired, like we talked about in 2 Timothy 3.16. It is our truth. Also, God's word, the Holy Bible, it illuminates, Right? We're told in Psalms 119, 105 that God's word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It reveals to us the good and the bad. It can show us the wise and the unwise. The Bible is the ultimate tool in learning how to live the best possible life free from the strengths of stumbling around in darkness. God's word is truth, plain and simple. And we can have perfect confidence in the fact that his words are accurate, true, and certain. And we're also reminded of our, the, the word of God we see in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is living and effective, and it's sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as a separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Wow. This all-powerful sword of the living God is able to cut through every defense our enemy raises. It doesn't matter what he does. We're able to cut down to the very division of bone and marrow. And I don't know about any of you guys, any of you guys have harvested like a, 
a deer or an elk or an oryx or if anyone's helped like butcher any type of livestock. If you have something that can cut through bone and marrow, we're talking about something that is supernaturally sharp. This is, I can't emphasize enough how sharp that would be to be able to cut through something like bone and marrow. So that implies we've got some supernatural weapon, right, that is extraordinarily sharp. And so with this weapon, when it's wielded by a servant of God, nothing can withstand its ability to cut straight to the core of a matter and uncover the truth. As soldiers in God's army, it's our responsibility and it's our duty to use his word to discern the truth and then to follow it, right? When God's word shows us something that's wrong in ourselves, we can use this spiritual weapon to surgically remove those offending thoughts and actions. Just like we're reminded in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, Paul states that, you know, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. You know, thinking about this, this sword of the Spirit, do we have any examples in the Bible of how to use this sword of the Spirit? We do, actually, right? We have one of the best examples in the world. We see Jesus Christ use this sword, right? And we look at, look at Matthew 4 and, and the other Gospels where we talk about Jesus when he faced uh, the, when the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, right? How did Jesus fight the devil in those situations? Right? He came back with Scripture, right? It was when Christ was being tempted, he, he fought back with Scripture, right? He used his faith in the word and the commands of God to repel Satan for a time. Though we know from Hebrews 4.15 that Christ was tempted in all things, so this was certainly not the only time that Jesus had an encounter with the devil, but the point is that Jesus used his sword. And when he was fighting the devil, that's what he used to combat Satan, right? So if this sword of the Spirit is good enough for Jesus, man, it's good enough for me, I think, right? That's why we only have one weapon, because that's all we need. But another interesting feature about swords is, what are they used for? They're used for close combat, right? It's not like firing missiles from thousands of miles away. We're talking about face-to-face -face combat. This implies that our battle is close, okay? And so armed only with our sword, we step out to fight our enemies head on, right? The struggle is real. It's immediate and it's right in front of us. But we fight knowing the end of the story. We're fighting a war that we already know who won, okay? Jesus has the ultimate victory. But lastly here, then Paul describes how even once we have all this armor, we still need to pray, right? We can have all this amazing armor, but are we going to be an effective soldier with this armor if we don't talk to our commanding officer? I don't think so, right? God is the commander of his spiritual army, and he alone knows how to lead us to victory. So we've got to talk to God on a regular basis, right? Satan knows this. Satan is always trying to cut off our prayer life. He knows that if we're not in communication with our Father, right, we're not in line with him, it's easier to attack us. It's much easier to get those arrows at us if we're not talking to our commanding officer, we need a connection to God, one that is maintained through regular prayer. Just like we're commanded in Philippians 4, chapter, chapter 4, verses 6, it says, Do not worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with the thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, is going to guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, no one said being a Christian is going to be easy, right? When you signed up for Team Jesus, you put on a new uniform, all right? You put on some armor. Right? You probably didn't realize that, but you're in the army now, buddy. So you've signed up to fight for the Lord. And the interesting point here is that he doesn't have any desk jobs where you can go and, and work at a desk way away from the front lines, right? There's no such thing. We're all on the front lines. We're all together as soldiers of Christ. So in conclusion, whether you like it or not, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you're in a battle. And again, if you didn't realize that or you're just ignoring this fact, then you're probably not winning the battle. You're probably losing. But out of God's amazing love and his, 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 and his mercy, he has given us everything we need to fight these battles each and every day. And something that I find interesting as I was studying and pre preparing for this message, you know, when you look at this, every piece of armor is really because of Jesus, is it not? Right? We've got a belt of truth. Right? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We got a breastplate of righteousness. Man, I'm only righteous because of what Jesus did for me. Right? I have a righteousness because of my right standing, because of what Jesus did for me. Nothing I can do can give me that breastplate. 
right? I also have these sandals that are ready with the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace, that, that is Jesus, right? He's the best news ever. Jesus is the gospel. Then we have a shield of faith, right? This is grounded in the faith that I have in Jesus, knowing that Jesus is coming back, knowing that the victory is his. And I've got a helmet of salvation. I only have salvation because of Jesus, right? I'm only saved because of what he did. I have done nothing to earn that helmet of salvation. And then I've got a sword. Yes, I've got a weapon. And even this sword, like we're reminded in, in the beginning of the Gospel of John, it says, in the beginning, the Word was with God and the Word was God. It's all about Jesus and what he's done for us no matter what, right? And another last thing here, you know, it's rare in Scripture where we see Jesus being very direct with his commands, right? He, he spoke a lot in parables and stories where the listener really had to seek and he had to, like, find the answer. But one verse I love that is so clear cut and Jesus just lays it out straight and simple enough where I can understand it is in John 15, 5. And this is where Jesus says something that is so direct and clear cut. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. How clear is that? That is going to be exactly the same as in true in battle, right? We cannot go to battle without Jesus. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. And so if we're going to go into battle, we're going to need Jesus and we're going to need his armor. We can't face Satan and his enemies on our own strength. Only by being strengthened by the Lord can we put on this full armor and go fight the battle. Well, what about some applications? How can you prepare for battle each and every day? Well, one thing, read your Bible, right? We've got to sharpen our sword daily. Right? Start memorizing scriptures and meditating on them and applying them, right? Use that sword of the Spirit. Don't forget, Satan knows the Bible pretty good. And in fact, he probably knows scriptures better than you or I, right? But he likes to twist them. He wants to take those words and take them out of context. And so we've got to know the truth. Sharpen your sword daily. And pray. And you've got to talk to your commanding officer all the time. Talk to him. Ask him for help. Say, God, I need help in this battle. Help me. Would you make sure that I've got on my armor? Pray and ask God to help you put on your armor every day. Help him to realize, help you to realize that you've got it on and that you're going to use it. And then lastly, this armor of God is, again, it's only for those that believe in and follow Jesus. So this raises a pretty important question. Do you know Jesus? Right? Do you have a relationship with him? Right? Do you have this armor? Do you want this armor? Because this armor is only available to Christians. Man, we'd be remiss if we didn't give you that opportunity to take that armor today. And so I want to take that opportunity now. And so we're going to just go through a simple prayer here in a second. And please know it has nothing to do with the words. You know, the special words. It's not some incantation that we're trying to say something special to God. It's all about your position. It's your posture and your position before God. And you're speaking with your heart, right? And so I'll give you some words in a second. But if, you're, if you want to know Jesus, if you want to fight this battle with the best armor in the world... Then, then I pray that you will pray this prayer with me, all right? So if you don't mind, if you would close your eyes and bow your heads. And we're going to ask Jesus for this armor. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I, I'm broken. I need you. I've been trying to live this life in my own armor and my own efforts, and I'm failing miserably. I can't do this on my own. I recognize I need you. I need your strength, and I need your salvation. And I just ask, Lord Jesus, that you would come in my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, will you please give me this armor? Give me this belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. Give me these shoes fitted with the gospel of peace. Give me this shield of faith and the sword. And help me, Lord, just to live a life that as an effective soldier for you. And we ask these things in your son's name. So if any of you did pray that prayer, and we would love to know about it, because now, yeah, you've got the armor of God, and we would love to come alongside you and help you as you begin your walk with Christ. And also, as, as we conclude this, again, thinking about this being graduation Sunday and thinking about all the graduates, I know a lot of graduates are off to, to college, right? And it's the next chapter, and I just, man, I'm strongly urging you, man, as you go off to that next chapter, there's gonna be lots of, lots of temptations, lots of new freedoms, right? I just beg you, please, make sure you're properly dressed. Make sure you're putting on your armor every day as you go into this next chapter. And don't leave behind your shield or your sword, okay? You're going to need that every day. And so I pray that you take that with you in your next chapter. Thank you.